Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and, uh, and get started. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to welcome everybody uh, here to the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. I am Chris Jelpe. I'm the Chair of Peace Studies and Conflict Resolution here at the Mershon Center, and I'm also a Professor of Political Science. Um, and I'm here uh, and very pleased to welcome uh, Jesse Driscoll today as our uh, 2015 uh, Furnace Book Award winner. Um, as many of you uh, may know, uh, the, the Furnace Book Award is named for the uh, founding director of the Mershon Center and is, um, and is given out every year to uh, an author whose first book makes an exceptional contribution to the study of international security. So uh, Jesse's book that, uh, that won the award is called Warlords and Coalition Politics in Post-Soviet States. Um, and it takes a look at the processes by which uh, well-functioning uh, domestic hierarchies have emerged after periods of anarchic violence after the collapse of, um, after the, collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, today, however, he's not going to be talking about this uh, wonderful book, although maybe you can take questions in Q&A if, uh, um, uh, if people have uh, questions that they want to ask about some of the field work that he did for that, uh, for that project. Uh, but today he's going to be talking to us about his, uh, his next project, which is on Ukraine's civil war. Um, Jesse is Associate Professor of Political Science um, at uh, the University of California at San Diego. Congratulations on just getting tenure. So, um, and he is also uh, Chair of the Global Leadership Institute at the School of uh, Public Policy, uh, School of Global Policy and Strategy at uh, UCSD. Um, and he is an area specialist in uh, the Caucasus and Central Asia. Um, he also has a secondary political interest in political behavior and does lots of really cool uh, survey experiments, which I like a lot, um, and, um, and has some very interesting work on um, collecting uh, political attitudes in um, areas that are plagued by violence and how can you do um, sampling techniques and, and things like that. So he's got a, a diverse array of, uh, of skills. Um, he received his PhD from uh, Stanford University and uh, so please join me in congratulating our Furnace Book Award winner, Jesse Driscoll. Um, so thank, thank you for having me. Uh, I have to admit, I didn't know there was a wall with all these plaques on it, and so seeing, uh, seeing the names really does stop you. Uh, 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 ben Valentino, Barry Posen, Krepinevich, um, Mike Brown, uh, th these are all giants to me. These were all my teachers. Uh, Mike Brown uh, introduced me to the Security Studies canon at Georgetown when I was an undergraduate, and um, it's just a huge honor to feel like my work is legible to, to this community, and so I... Uh, you know, I could, I could go on for a long time in that vein. Um, I have a lot of thank yous, but um, it's not what you're here for, so I'll just I'll move forward. Uh, the, um, the provocation is this. So uh, when my book went to press, I was contacted by the series editor and told that, you know, while it's wonderful that you spent so much time uh, doing so much responsible field work uh, in uh, the spirit of curating history in Georgia and Tajikistan, it's very, very clear from the work that you did that you um, you know, you went deep. You know, you left, you left some blood on the tracks in, in both of those places. Uh, what I really want you to do if you want people to read your book is to write something about Ukraine and put it in the conclusion. Because then um, uh, it will it'll have two effects. You know, first it will show that you're capable of actually paying attention to what's going on outside of your um, cloistered academic space and notice that the, that the world is potentially paying attention to your theory. You just need to have the courage to talk about it and, and that would be good. Um, it would also have the effect of time capsuling your book, as the, like your book will be an artifact that was published at a particular time um, as Ukraine is breaking down, and so you know that it can go into uh, it can go into libraries and people can be like, oh yeah, 2015, I remember what was happening. Ukraine was breaking down, so I added a 10-page section to the back of the book as it went to press, and um, in that section I call Ukraine, uh, I call what's going on in Ukraine a civil war. And I have taken um, no end of grief for that choice. Um, but I, I do think that the series editor was right. I, the, the choice to talk about Ukraine was the right choice. But um, the decision to call it a, a civil war was sticky. Um, I have since learned more about Ukraine. And I have spent a lot of time hanging out with people who consider themselves uh, 
uh, interested parties in Ukrainian social memory, um, not just Ukrainians in the diaspora, but Americans who are interested in the representation of these, of these matters. And um, the language of civil war is controversial. Um, I now understand better why it is controversial than I did at the time, um, but I wanted to extend, uh, I want to use my time here to talk about my next book project, um, which is a book which is tentatively called Ukraine's Civil War, and I'm going to explain why. Um, and I don't mean to be defensive about it, I just want to kind of put all of the arguments in one place. And, uh, you know, thank you to the, for the Mershon Center for the, the opportunity to do that. So, the outline of the talk, uh, I think that uh, it's quite clear at this point that most Western governments and Russia um, have mutually conflicting narratives of what has taken place in Ukraine and both are signaling resolve over, um, over the conflict. And in that world, um, when both are trying to signal resolve, uh, there, there seems to be a diplomatic deadlock that may be permanent. And there, there's language that you can use that is ready language for diplomacy to signal resolve. Um, if we call what has taken place in Ukraine uh, an invasion, or we use the word occupation, it signals that we are aware that there is a UN charter out there and that Article 2 is part of it, and that a massive violation of international law has taken place. And if you use the word invasion and occupation all the time everywhere you go, um, you do lock that particular bargaining position in. Um, the language of civil war is further complicated by the fact that it emerged out of Russian disinformatia um, during the uh, contested periods that I'm going to talk about in the first part of my talk, which is to say there are a lot of people who think that when you call what's going on in Ukraine a civil war, what you're doing is playing dumb or being naive about the fact that Russia had something to do with this. Wait, so it, Russia had nothing to do with this? It's a civil war? And it's easy to see how you could come to that conclusion because I do think Russian diplomats were claiming for a long time quite disingenuously that they had nothing to do with what was going on in Ukraine when I think most people would say that they did. With that said, with both of those caveats, which are important, um, and there's other reasons to not use the language of civil war, which we could talk about, um, I think that the language of civil war could be used to draw attention to some Pareto improving bargains between the P5 of the United Nations, the non-rotating members of the United Nations, um, which would make everyone better off. There's a really good book that I recommend that anyone who wants a background on Ukraine read by Tim Colton and Sam Sharap called Everyone Loses. If it's true that everyone's losing, we could think a way out of this would be Pareto improving and that everyone would do better. And I think that using the language of civil war actually helps get us there. And that's the claim I'm going to make today. Um, there is a uh, relevant comparative politics literature on civil war settlements that can be useful here, and I'm going to try to curate that literature for you informally um, over the course of my talk. I also want to make sure that I leave plenty of time for questions because I'm sure there will be a lot to talk about. So what is the civil war? What do I mean when I say Ukraine is having a civil war? Well, let's be clear. As political scientists, um, and particularly I'm a former student of James Fearon and David Layton. I'm, I'm still a student of James Fearon and David Layton. Um, it never stops. Um, it's a term of art. Um, it, what makes something a civil war? Well, uh, one standard measurement move, if you're going to try to do cross-national comparison, is you say that um, a country experiences a civil war if you have 1,000 people who have died in political violence inside a country with at least 100 of those deaths against state security forces. This is a coding rule that eliminates massacres, riots, and crime waves. It has to be political violence, and it has to be two-sided. Um, according to data from the UN um, Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, that death threshold was passed in the early summer of 2014. Uh, Ukraine will appear in future IR data sets, full stop. So, I put this slide up because this is the trend line of what deaths looked like. The um, sh slightly more dark column is uh, the civilian deaths. The lighter column is the sum total of civilian and military deaths. This is what the death count looks like at the time my book went to press. So when I was making the claim that Ukraine is a civil war, this is the data I was looking at. It's pretty linear. And civilian victimization is making up the bulk of the casualties at this time. Um, way more than 1,000 people have died and more than 100 of them on the government side. Case closed, right? No, of course not. Um, it is never, it's never as simple as political scientists you know, like to make it in large-end data sets. Um, a common next move in the debate, um, if you are having this debate in the real world, not in academia, in Ukraine's public sphere, is you say, look, those people fighting in the Donbass region of East Ukraine, those aren't real Ukrainians. Um, and, you know, I appreciate the candor there, <laughs> um, because you know, different people mean different things when they say real Ukrainians and you can start parsing the conversation. Um, what I'm going to do for the next 15 minutes is try to, um, try to challenge that claim. Um, I think it is important to take a big step back, and uh, that's 
that's what I'm going to do. This quote from Stathis Kalevis, um, whose book I think a lot of people consider seminal, I certainly do, um, uh, has this definition of civil war, emphasizing that for it to be a civil war, one of the characteristics defining is that the actors have to be subject to a common authority at the onset of hostilities. So notice the phrasing, at the onset of hostilities. Let's wind the clock back. This is an electoral map of Ukraine. These are all of the single member electoral districts for their parliament, which they call the Rada. So shaded in black is the ruling coalition of 2013. It's called the Party of Regions. You can see, just eyeballing the map, this is an eastern party. Uh, the Party of Regions didn't need a coalition partner. Um, although they had one, they had a couple. Um, they, had a, they, they had pretty much a straight up majority in parliament. They also controlled the office of the president. They had the votes, they're very disciplined. Um, the previous president, uh, a gentleman named Viktor Yushchenko uh, was elected in the course of the Orange Revolution of 2004. Many of you probably know of it, or certainly most of you have heard of it. Um, and once he got in, he pushed hard for NATO membership. Uh, this is something that would have been uh, unthinkable in the 1990s, uh, but also pushed for an economic turn towards Europe. Um, he was uh, pushed out of power and um, replaced by this gentleman named Viktor Yanukovych, who was the 2004 runner-up and elected president in 2010. You can see uh, that this is a east-west divided society. Um, you can see that the base of power uh, for the party of regions, this is now um, Yanukovych, is, is in the far east. There are certain districts in an area called the Donbass over on uh, the far left-hand side of the map where you have district by district voter turnout uh, more than 90% and not more than 90% of the people voting for the party of regions. So this is really you know, that kind of party. Um, in, at, least in, at least in the East. So, so what, does, uh, what does Yanukovych do? Well, he swears off NATO, but he sort of stays on the fence about economics. So a very, very clear line on security geopolitics, but a more um, ambiguous line on geoeconomics, if you want to call it that. Um, he plays along with the EU's Eastern Partnership Program, um, but then also uh, bargains very hard with Moscow over joining its version of uh, a free trade agreement, the EEU. Uh, most of you have never probably heard of the EEU. It's the Eastern European Union. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's Russia's answer to, to the EU. Um, now, this activates uh, a lot of really high-stakes politics in Ukrainian society that break east-west in predictable ways. Um, Ukraine has a big population, uh, 40 million people. If you're, going, if you're Russia and you're thinking about neighbors that you would like to have free trade with for economic reasons, Ukraine is the prize. Um, concretely, you drink a lot of... Uh, Ukra you, you drink a lot of Baltica beer in Ukraine. They, 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 uh, they, they consume the same stuff. So it, it would make sense for Russia for this to be the prize. And Vladimir Putin had spent a lot of time and political energy trying to maneuver uh, Ukraine into the EEU. But locking in free trade with Russia, if you live and work in the eastern part of the country, where you have a lot of company towns that are producing goods that aren't really globally competitive once they're produced at market prices, it makes sense to want to lock in trade with your, with your neighbor. Uh, in the West, the shoe is really on the other foot. In the West, people are looking at Poland, and people are asking, you know, why, why not us? Like, why aren't our kids getting jobs as nannies in the suburbs of London? Um, I have been teaching my kid English and German for the last eight years. Why aren't we joining the EU? And, you know, those kinds of questions are pretty high stakes. When you start talking about your children's life opportunities, um, you start thinking, even in abstract terms, about status reversals for your children. Um, you know, as a, as a parent, I have to admit I understand uh, this stuff better than I did before. I think Roger Peterson is right. I think status reversals really um, can mobilize people. So here are some mobilized people. This is a picture from the Maidan. Um, it's a large square in central Kiev. Uh, the fall of 2013, crowds start to form. Uh, and uh, implicit in this activism is a forced comparison between the EU and the EEU. Concretely, if we were in Russia or if Putin had more influence here, you know we wouldn't even be able to do this, right? We couldn't all be protesting like this if Putin had more influence here. Uh, it's not subtext. It's pretty much all text. Um, the first death in Maidan was on November 30th. Uh, riot squads turned clubs and flash grenades and tear gas on a meeting, um, and you have your first martyr. As soon as it becomes a movement with martyrs, police tactics change, and it morphs into a sort of symbolic challenge over the right to demonstrate and the right to speak, um, the right to do Occupy Wall Street-type tactics, a living democracy movement, if you want to use that language. Sit-ins are organized in government buildings. Calls for Yanagovich to resign become common. Tim Colton, uh, the gentleman I mentioned before who wrote Everyone Loses, reports that about 100 lives were lost between January and February, mostly to police snipers, but you know, some to marchers with Molotov cocktails and firearms. Um, so 
when we talk about civil society here, it's not all vegetarian co-ops and, and kids on Facebook. You know, there's an organized militant backbone that does emerge in, in Ukraine that has much more of a, of a Charlottesville feel. Uh, things escalate, especially in February. They come to a head on February 20th. This is the day of what is called the Maidan Massacre. Um, snipers fired on protesters and 40 people die. Let's go back to this map. The day of the Maidan massacre, there's a special meeting of parliament. What is discussed is a symbolic censoring resolution saying that all of the violence is the president's fault, ordering all the police to return to their barracks, saying there's going to be investigation, that kind of thing. It's the sort of symbolic action um, put forward by someone in one of the white districts, you know, uh, blame, putting all of this violence on the president. This is a picture of the coalition that had the votes in the Rada to stop that, ma that motion from passing. If they had just stayed disciplined, the motion would have passed. But it does pass because these people defect. I'll show you again. These people defect. At the end of the day, after the motion has passed, it's entirely clear that the security force is defecting to the square, the regime is disintegrating, and there's a wave of party, uh, party of regions defections that day through the night and all the next day. People symbolically stand up in parliament. They say, listen, I'm not giving up my chair. I'm going to keep voting in this body, but I would take off your, my party lapel pin, and I want you to know that I'm not part of this, um, this machine anymore. Um, so by the close of business the next day on February 21st, this is the party of regions. Um, one reason that I like these maps is that absolutely no one thinks the CIA is this good. <laughs> and um, if there's one thing that I want up on the internet forever, I want it to be that. Um, people, uh, when I say absolutely no one has a theory the CIA is this good, that's actually not true, there, that, as I will explain in a moment. But, I mean, come on, right? Don't you think we'd do it more if we could? Right? Okay, so look. This is clearly evidence of Ukrainian agency of some sort. The other reason I like these maps is that even after Maidan succeeds in every reasonable way that you would think of succeeding in a movement like this, there are still plenty of people out there that continue to see things from the point of view of the old regime. And they aren't randomly distributed around the country. They, they tend to be located in Crimea and in the Donbass region, which I mentioned before are party strongholds. Yanukovych flees in the middle of the night. Uh, people wake up on February 22nd and there's no head of state. People take their camera phones into the presidential mansion and pictures like this go viral with the help of the New York Times. Uh, Americans and Europeans are euphoric about this turnaround uh, and they recognize a Euromaidan government that's uh, you know, forming um, in real time. Uh, for the Russians, this is described pretty unambiguously as an unconstitutional coup against a legitimately elected president who just happened to be unpopular in Washington and Brussels. Um, those two narratives diverge and have not come even close to, to reconverging at, the time of, at, at this time. Um, but it's also worth remembering that all of this is personally embarrassing to Putin. Uh, recall that the Russian Winter Olympics were going on at this time. This was supposed to be a really high prestige moment for, for Putin and instead you have this kind of stuff happening. So, you know, uh, a lot of people have speculated about his psychology and basically have speculated in the same way. They say, so he got hot, he got emotional, he took Crimea. I don't know, that's a psychological claim. I don't have any I don't have access to data there, but um, this is a picture of the little green men that were used, uh, special forces, to make Crimea happen. It was pretty clean. Four people died, one uniformed Ukrainian ensign and three civilians. Um, there was a hastily organized voting exercise, March 15th, um, that uh, did not have, by the way, on the ballot an option to remain part of Ukraine, but, you know, they voted. Um, and there's no war in Crimea, and today Russia says the Crimea issue is closed. So that's uh, national self-determination. They wanted to be a part of Russia. They are. We're all done. No civil war. You do not have 1,000 people dead. You don't have 100 deaths on the government side. I'm putting this up uh, because I think that this picture is probably fake. Uh, if you had been watching um, Russian news at the time, though, you would have seen a lot of pictures like this. Um, so a lot of people, I think, reasonably describe this as an information warfare campaign. Um, the, the flags here, you have on the left a NATO flag on the right a Nazi flag and in the middle the flag of a militia group called Azov. Um, it's a, a, a far-right Ukrainian paramilitary group with symbolism going back to World War II. You know, if you are a Russian speaker and you are steeped in World War II history, you know what this is supposed to mean. Um, and you, you know, the, uh, if you Google around the internet, you'll find a lot of pictures like this. Uh, I'm alternative facts. So uh, what's interesting uh, is that this doesn't actually get picked up all that much by Russian-speaking Ukrainians within Ukraine. 
and we should be very glad of that if it had been picked up more by Russian-speaking um, Ukrainians within Ukraine. I think you might have had an insurgency in a much more bloody war than we actually had. You could have had uprisings in places like Odessa if people really believed that this was really happening, but you didn't. Um, I have a paper that is under review right now looking at a bunch of social media behaviors on Twitter, documenting that as a social fact. We pulled the Twitter stream in real time, and um, the paper hasn't been accepted yet, but as a social fact, as a stylized fact, um, if these pictures really had gone viral in the memory or in the you know, social understanding of Ukrainians who are Russians, self-identified Russians and Russian speakers living in certain parts of Ukraine, the war would have been a lot worse. So uh, Russia also tries to use special forces, the Strelkov group, and media to engineer an uprising, but it fails. So um, you know what happens? Uh, in the east, there is a rump party of regions elite, which is clearly finished. You know they, they have been getting reelected and reelected and reelected for a long time, but now they have been thrown out of power by um, by street power. So there's total incapacitation in the part of the country that realizes that its party now has no real power and no real authority. And so anti-systemic forces, um, what I, I um, euphemistically with my co-author, I, I call them sons of anarchy types, um, they just start to seize government buildings. And there's no one to stop them. Um, and uh, certain areas make clumsy attempts to secede and like have referendums, but the referendums aren't really recognized by Russia. This only takes place in the Far East, in the Donbass region. The best data on this, day-by-day -day data, is actually coded by a uh, political scientist at the University of Michigan named Yuri Zukov. Um, he used uh, uh, Facebook accounts from the different militias as they organized, um, claiming which towns they were organizing in to keep track of the shifting front lines. And he's made all of this data into maps, and these maps will eventually be made public. It's an amazing public good brought to you by um, you know, your Midwestern football rival um, and, the dis <laughs> and the discipline of political science and Google and Facebook, and you're welcome. Um, like This kind of data coming out of civil war zones is very rare. Like usually one of the things that starts happening when you have state failure is that we start losing track of how many people are dying or where are the troops happening. One of the interesting things about this war, as Yuri's data set demonstrates, is that that's not true. Um, I've left this photo up for a long time so everyone could, could kind of get your heads around it. This is not a fabricated photograph. This is um, the airport in the Donbass. Uh, after Petro Poroshenko is elected in late, Mar in late May, in, by the way, an election where the far-right nationalists did terribly, uh, you know, it's a center-right coalition that elects him, um, and it's a nonviolent election. You know, it, it is not an election that, that, that where, where things went badly. He feels he has a mandate to use conventional warfare to just shatter the will uh, to fight of the people living in the East. And he starts dropping artillery, or he gives orders for the troops to start dropping artillery, and they do. Um, and the damage is very real. And um, uh, interestingly, during this period, they also try to use air power to bomb positions, but they find their planes are being shot down and their helicopters are being shot down. Um, this enter the, the awareness that the rebels in the Donbass have anti-air capability, which are quite unusual, enters the attention of the world when the Malaysian airliner is shot down. But they had been shooting down planes for a while, and that's something that rebels almost never have the capacity to do. So that is two pieces of evidence that this is a highly conventionalized war. Most of what we talk about in civil war studies, when we're talking about civil wars, we're talking about asymmetric irregular war. That's where our heads are at because we've all been looking at Afghanistan and, and Iraq and trying to think through those sorts of those sorts of things. This has much more a feeling of something theatrically like World War II. Um, the, the damage is real. Uh, the war produces pretty quickly about a million refugees as people run away from stuff like this. And the industrial production comes to a complete halt. The currency collapses. The costs are very, very real. Um, I'm not going to present any data on bifurcated social memory because I don't have time and I don't want to use the time I have to try to, to try to tell competing stories. The wounds are all still bleeding here. Um, but I do want to present one really informative map on political polarization after the fact. And uh, Keith Darden, now at American University, deserves credit for drawing my attention to this particular empirical fact. Uh, I, you know, it's my map, but, but he, he, he saw it first. This is an electoral map of Ukraine um, from the following October. So this is subsequent to that bombing I just talked about. Um, this is um, the, behavioral th um, the behavior that we are interested in is showing up to vote on election day. So not talking about uh, which party you voted for at all. We're talking about showing up to vote on election day at all. Um, so 
The coloring is voter turnout by district membership. You can see the scale here um, on the side. Uh, there's a couple of things that just pop right out at you. First, you know, obviously, no one's voting in Crimea. No one's voting in the Donbass. Okay, that's, um, that's interesting, but not nearly as interesting as um, the very, very high levels of voter turnout in the far west and the very, very low levels of voter turnout um, in the center in the east. You can look at this map and see a lot of different kinds of things. The, the language that I like to use is crisis of representation um, in Ukrainian politics. That doesn't mean that it's not a solvable crisis of representation, but um, a lot of people uh, feel they're being, living in the East, feel that they're being uh, governed by a party they didn't vote for, and that is not true of people in the Far West. People in the Far West are pretty sure they're being governed by a party that they voted for. Um, and it's a little more complicated than that, but it's not a lot more complicated than that. This east-west divide is one of these well-known sociological facts that, that Sam Huntington drew our attention to. And you can make maps that show this east-west split in a lot of ways. This one is, is, about, uh, is about voter turnout, though. I'm going to hold questions till the end. Is that all right? Yeah. All right, cool. So back to this. This is an, you know, if everyone fighting on the separatist side were, were Russian, if everyone fighting in the East were a little green man, um, or maybe, maybe even if most of them were little green men, maybe this wouldn't be a civil war. Um, and uh, that is an empirical claim, and I'm pretty sure that it's false. And the best single piece of evidence I have that it's false is this. Um, uh, first off, there is indisputable evidence that many Kremlin agents have, have crossed the border. Um, I don't think that's something pe most people even bother trying to deny, even in the Russian government anymore. But we also have evidence that the backbone of the fighting force that has tried to opt out of Ukraine in the Donbass region, at least back in 2014, as the thousand death mark was being passed, was Ukrainian. And, and this is the evidence. Um, there is a list of security forces um, that the Ukrainian government is fighting against, a list of disloyal citizens that was made in the summer of, in fall of 2014, which has subsequently leaked. So the Ukrainian state security services themselves were keeping track of who they were fighting against. And seven, the list identifies 78% of the combatants fighting at the time of Ukrainian citizens uh, fighting in, in basically their home regions. And so that might be uh, fabricated, but that is a pretty sophisticated kind of fabrication. That is fabrication within the Ukrainian government saying 78% of these people are, 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 are Ukrainians. Of course, they're Russian-speaking Ukrainians, but that's a common thing. If you're trying to make the claim that Russian-speaking Ukrainians aren't real Ukrainians, now we're having a much more interesting and controversial conversation, and you're also a, a fringer, and I'm not sure I want it to go on for very long. You know, if, if, if what you meant by, you know, well, they're not real Ukrainians is, well, I don't want to have to be in a policy with those Russians, good. Thank you for saying that, and please say it into this microphone so that we can, like, you know, you've disqualified yourself from electoral office. You know, at least we know who you are. Um, finally, and just with a bullet here, um, just because there's foreign troops running around inside the country doesn't mean it stops being a civil war, right? I mean, most civil war studies that have come out in the United States are basically based on microdata from Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and I, we started one of those wars, and, and the other one we got involved in midway through. But that doesn't mean it's not a civil war. It just means it's a civil war that Americans happen to have shown up for. Um, and that happens all the time. If you try to make a list of civil wars since 1945 that have no foreign presence at all, um, y your list gets very short very fast. During the Cold War, in the wars of decolonization, you know, there's just a lot of different ways to mess around in a war zone without getting the UN involved. Uh, an important turning point in the war is late August 2014. Uh, it looks then like the Ukrainian military is going to push through and really punch through the line. Um, the Russian army intervenes at this point, um, uh, supplementing the separatist forces with heavy artillery, um, heavy infantry. It doesn't work very hard to hide the fact that it's doing so. So this is a pretty overt intervention by the Russian military in, um, in, in August. Uh, that freezes the conflict. So the, the, the lines on the map don't change very much after that intervention. Um, Indulge me with a couple more maps and pictures. Um, the map on the left is um, from Wikipedia two days ago. Uh, one of the best ways um, to, to get information on this particular war is just go on Wikipedia. If the map had changed, someone would have updated it in real time. It hasn't. And the map hasn't changed uh, since the fall of 2014. There are fixed front lines. It's highly conventional. You have a no man's land that is patrolled by people with snipers and scopes, and um, it's relatively well understood um, how to stay away from those people, which is quite good news for civilians. Uh, a point I'll, make, I'll follow up on a moment. The picture on the right is a memory wall. This is a picture I took um, while I was, I was, I was in Kiev. 
Um, these are photographs of martyrs from the war, um, improvised by members of Ukrainian civil society. And um, one of the ways that the war in Ukraine is different from most civil wars is that we have unusually granular data like this. As I said before, oftentimes in civil war studies we start um, wondering what is going on in the war zone. We, we have the opposite problem in Ukraine. We, we have a ubiquitous amount of information on exactly what is going on in the war zone. Um, it's a good problem to have. It's the kind of problem that social scientists love, too much data. Um, I can make maps of the individual birthplaces of people who have died on the Ukrainian side, and I'm sure that someday Russians will be able to make the same maps um, from their side. I, um, uh, yeah, more on that in a moment. Uh, I showed you before the first three bars of this slide, um, and I gave the impression that it was on a linear trajectory upward. Uh, luckily, I was wrong at the time my book went to print. I love that. Um, you can see that after, uh, after the winter of 2015, civilian deaths basically flatten out completely. And you move to a war in which uh, military soldiers keep killing military soldiers for another year and a half, and then even they basically stop. Um, but civilians can get out of the way when the war fighting, and this is the central insight in my reading of Kalibas' 2006 book, when the war fighting is irregular, uh, the technology of warfare requires civilian hearts and minds to be part of the resource that's being fought over, and so you eventually start mutilating them. And when the warfare is conventional, um, you can draw a line. Both sides can have civilians that they can tax, and uh, they can stay out of the way. So a lot of people have gone home. Those million refugees that I mentioned before, a lot of them have gotten in improvised taxi services and actually gone home. And they, go, they can go home because once they get there, um, it's not like the case in guerrilla warfare where the rebels control the town during the day and the government controls it at night or vice versa. You, just, you don't have the denunciation mechanism. You don't have any of those things that um, cause the death count to climb and climb and climb. And we know this with certainty because there are so many different monitors in the area and because the whole area is saturated by people who have cell phones that are attached to the Internet. These numbers end in single digits. We can keep track of individual people who are dying. And that allows me to say with certainty something that is amazing and lovely to be able to report, which is that I am pretty certain that there is not a single example in this war of a pregnant woman having the baby cut out of her stomach. If that had happened even one time, I think it would have gone viral on the internet. If even one time you had had mass rapes or a mass grave, I think that would have happened on the internet. The number of times that has happened is zero. Right? This is an unusually clean war in that way. And I'm sorry to say that stuff graphically, but that does happen a lot in irregular warfare, and it simply hasn't happened in Ukraine. Usually we don't know. <laughs> Usually, when it's a civil war, you're losing track of what's happening and, and you hear these stories about terrible things that are happening. I'm not claiming that terrible things aren't happening. I'm saying that in this particular case, evidence of absence um, and absence of evidence are, uh, are actually pretty close to the same thing, I hope. You know, maybe there's secret stuff happening, but I, I would be surprised, I have to say. On the left here, um, so this is also something interesting that you can do. Um, uh, these are the different militias that formed in Ukraine. Um, I kept track of them as they were forming uh, for completely self-serving reasons, I must say. I, I, I uh, um, could see how this would work in the argument of my book, and so I wanted to keep track of these, um, these different individuals as they were, as they were uh, organizing. And as I said, they organized publicly. They organized on Facebook. Um, and so I didn't think I was collecting any data that a lot of other people weren't collecting, too. I didn't see any unique human subjects harm to just keeping track of who they were. Um, and then I, they have these public numbers that they use to recruit, so I called them up. I talked to them or I talked to their recruiting people. You know, we, 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 we did interviews. What's interesting about the trend over time is that they've all ended up joining the state. Um, so what looked at the time like the descent of Ukraine into warlordism now looks more like a kind of a social media-enabled media levy en masse. Um, where the Ministry of the Interior and the Ministry of Defense are now saturated with characters that I think reasonable people could call warlords at time T0, and now they say, what do you mean, warlords? I'm a lieutenant colonel. I've got my badge. I've got a uniform. What's, what's, what's the problem? Um, maybe there are problems. Maybe there aren't. The one major group that has not integrated its soldiers into the command structure of the Ukrainian state is, is Azov, um, the flag from the middle from before. Um, that's a picture of Azov organizing in front of the St. Sophia Cathedral in downtown Kiev that I took. 
they haven't integrated yet, um, but the, uh, the picture on the, on the upper right is um, the kind of billboard on a bus stop that you can see all over Kiev, um, or you, uh, less now, but a year ago you could see them all over Kiev. It's like, call this number, you want to sign up, sign up. Um, and it's, it's very public and it's, it's pretty open. So, uh, yeah, enough on that for now. Uh, the good news, again, to emphasize this, uh, Russian is the lingua franca on both sides of the line up front, and there's a lot of people who are, who are fighting there. People are making pilgrimages to this front line in order to fire guns at Russians, or are making pilgrimages to this front line in, in order to fire guns, you know, at Nazis. And they, you know, the, the stories are not healing. Like, that is, a, that, is a, that is a sad, inert social fact. However, there is also a happy, inert social fact, which is that civilians seem to have been left out of it thus far, and that might persist. Um, so good news and bad news about a persistent frozen conflict is that, um, you know, the bad news is that if the Donbass region of Ukraine evolves in the direction of Abkhazia or Transdenistria, except with less secure borders and better armed militias on both sides, you know, that, that outcome is potentially scary. That could become a flashpoint for, free, for future war. Um, but the good news is that if, if territory doesn't change hands at all, civilians are basically okay in this situation. So the great powers could ignore it. In the absence of a real breakdown where you have a serious style refugee crisis, um, it could be that the great powers will just let this simmer and go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, so how do these things end? How do civil wars end? Um, how you answer this question really depends, uh, in my experience, on what kind of baggage you bring, you bring to the question. There are reasonable people who disagree within political science about what assumptions we should bring to the table as we try to answer this question. And I think that this two by two is a, is a useful way to organize the space. Um, notice that these are, uh, I, I really am a fan of Jan Elster's discussion of mechanisms here. I'm not trying to horse race these different mechanisms against one another. The, the different cells each contain fully, fully self-confident research programs that just have different assumptions about what really keeps the Civil War settled. And I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean. So the vertical dimension is meant to capture the willingness and capacity of a third party intervener to show up and help. So at the high end of the spectrum, you'd imagine a very well-informed third party intervener that has a lot of granular intelligence on what's taking place on the ground and willingness to act on the intel that they have. And at the bottom of the spectrum, you'd imagine that you have no third party or one that doesn't care very much about what's going on on the ground or something like that. The left-right dimension of the two by two is basically the military balance of forces that you believe lends itself to lasting peace. And um, you have hegemony on the left and balancing on the right. So um, probably the most famous account of Civil War termination, the one account that everyone in this room, one way, I'm sure you all have this in your heads, um, uh, whether you admit it to yourselves or not, I'm sure you have it, is um, Thomas Hobbes. Um, Thomas Hobbes, there's no third party because he's writing 300 years, more than 300 years before the UN Charter. And his observation, uh, a scientific observation, is that the social contract is imposed violently um, and you are forced to take the knee. It's a kind of a Game of Thrones world. And that's it. Um, uh, you, you, you take the knee um, and that's how the war ends. Decisive military victory with no third party. Um, there are policy implications that come from this. If you really believe that that is the way that wars end, it has implications. We know uh, from the work of Monica Toft and others that in, as an empirical fact, incumbents tend to win against insurgents. We have known that for a long time. And so the policy implication that tends to, to be emergent from this is that we ought to just send guns and aid to the state and not pay too much attention to what they do with it, assume that the state is better at determining who's a criminal and who's not than we are, um, which is an outsourcing problem. And this, this does happen a lot of the time. Uh, there's a big debate on this axis. Um, there have been a lot of people in my lifetime um, who I do consider to be uh, amazing scholars and, and, and uh, very, very powerful personalities um, that have won this book award, by the, by the way, people like Mike Brown, um, that say, look, uh, <laughs> uh, we can empirically contest the claim that civil wars have to end with decisive military victory and that third parties can't do anything. And you can do it with different kinds of data and Paige Fortna and Barbara Walter, Doyle and Sam Banas, Steve Stedman, Fearon and Layton, none of these people are saucer-eyed utopians. Um, these are all people who are good at coding things and good at counting things and would say that wars don't have to end all the time with grinding military attrition. You don't have to root for the bad guys to beat the other bad guys. Um, 
uh, Mike Brown, former, former winner of the Furnace Award, uh, once memorably said, if we can act in the face of atrocity and we're pretty sure that it can work, it may be morally diminishing to pretend as if we can't and call ourselves scientists. That's a pretty good line. So this slide has too many words on it, and I don't really want to talk about it uh, unless you guys do. Um, we can come back to it if you'd like. All I really wanted to get to with this slide is to say that there are a pretty well established and coherent set of liberal mechanisms for peace building in the upper right cell. Um, so if you ask the question in the following way, what are the things that the UN can do to make peace processes work better or work with a higher probability, you know, thank you for asking. Here's what you can do. And um, the reason that we have mechanisms in this way that are important is that we have to be able to write grants um, uh, and explain what we're doing with the money that we're about to spend in war zones. So. Um, I want to say one more thing that is not on this slide but is an important, you know, anchor point. If the problem is that, uh, if the problem is not that the UN has no efficacy, but the problem is that everybody secretly knows that the UN has efficacy but no one wants to pay for it, those are two really different worlds, right? And uh, the work of Fearon and Leighton, uh, International Security 2004, the original um, title of the article was Postmodern Imperialism. I think that what actually finally got through the referee process was something more banal like neo-trusteeship and the problem of weak states. But they, uh, they make the argument that it is fundamentally a collective action problem on the part of the P5 of the United Nations of who sends a peacekeeping force most of the time. And we know it's a collective action problem because the UN writes very, very impressive mandates for its troops and then systematically underfunds them. And one of the P5 of the United Nations has to, for coordination purposes, step up and actually provide special forces, expensive troops, um, not Jordanians and Bangladeshis, but expensive troops to anchor the presence in the war zone. And the truth is no one really wants to do it. And that is a sort of a universal framework for understanding shirking in the UN Security Council is, is, is pretty powerful and informs my work. But notice that once they're there, we know what they're supposed to be doing. So. Through this framework, what can we say about Ukraine? Um, are we right on the brink of decisive military victory by Ukrainians over people in the Donbass? No, we're probably not. The lower left-hand mechanism, I don't, I don't see it. It's hard to see how you would drop enough bombs to make that happen. Um, maybe Russia will win decisively. Maybe Ukraine is about to tip over and fall and crack like an egg um, and, and fall into Russia's hands. I, I, I don't see that either, um, and I, I don't think most other people do. So maybe the lower left-hand corner is not where this is going to be. Um, what about the liberal solutions? Why can't we just get a big UN peacekeeping operation in there? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, first, as I mentioned before, Russia and the United States both have a theory that the other one started this. And um, for that reason, um, Russia and the United States, and I, I would say the United States and Great Britain, the Anglophone countries, um, can be pretty sure to veto a resolution if it were to come from Russia to make Russia the lead state mandated in the UN Security Council resolution. Reciprocally, uh, Russia uh, feels that it is trying to push back and signal something about NATO being a little bit too close to its nuclear red lines. So if the United States charitably decided to volunteer its special forces services to you know, be the lead state of the United Nations, Russia would veto. And that could stalemate for a very long time. I wish I had an optimistic next thing to say there, but I don't. That could stalemate for a very, very long time. Um, I, I, I have a utopian imagined solution that I'll end the talk with, but it could end there for a long time, full stop. It could be that that stalemate is actually just one of these places that stops the United Nations machinery from working. It's happened before, that the United States and Russia can't agree on stuff, so the UN mechanism stops working for a certain set of problems. Even if we could solve that, there would then be a free riding problem about who pays for it. <laughs> That's, that is the big insight of Firon and Leighton and why I brought it up a moment ago, is that even if we could get the legal part of it right, that doesn't mean that we actually get a lot of money into the region because there's still an incentive for everyone to pass the buck. Uh, my work is on cases that are similar to this, which is why I'm here today and talking about this. If you ask the question, why were the post-Soviet wars so short, which is the book that I used to motive, the, the question I used to motivate my book, part of the answer is that there was no collective action problem on the part of the UN Security Council. If you ask the question, okay, so, okay, okay guys, there's five, 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 five great powers here. Who's going to intervene in Tajikistan? You know, everybody just looks at Russia, right? Similar with Georgia, similar with all of the countries that right before the Civil War were parts of the Soviet Union. It was quite obvious it was their sphere of influence. So 
that's the good news, is that you do get UN Security Council resolutions and you do get peacekeeping forces in there. Um, the bad news is that absolutely no one thinks that they did the kind of stuff that I put up on that slide two slides ago. Um, and it's actually offensive. If you show up in Georgia or you show up in Tajikistan and you ask people, so like, hey, aren't you grateful for all those public goods that the Russians provided? You know, you'll get, you'll get in trouble or, you know, maybe you'll just get stared at. But um, people will think you don't really understand what happened in the 1990s. So um, the way that David Layton likes to say this, I think it's pithy but, but, but useful, is that uh, there's this one member of the UN Security Council that none of the other four members trust, um, and that's Russia. And so you can try to tie their hands, but if you know that they're going to be on the ground and you also know that you're not going to trust them more tomorrow than you trust them today, what are you supposed to do? Um, this is my favorite picture of, of Russian peacekeeping, um, <coughs> Russia providing public goods. This is a Russian uh, peacekeeper blowing smoke in the face of, of his Georgian um, counterpart across the line. Um, but my book's research design was essentially calibrated to answer this question or to ask this question and then answer it as well as I could. So the comparison between Tajikistan and Georgia holds a lot of things constant. Um, including the fact that Russia is the third party intervener, and then asks, how did it work and what did Russia get right? Um, a cynical response, or a cynical simplification of what I said in the book, is to say that what actually happens is that Russia pretends to do liberal stuff, locals pretend to play along, no one really disarms, the West funds everything, and eventually people kind of work it out. Um, that is more or less what I argue in the book. and. Um, uh, of course, I want you to read the book, and I don't want that to be the only takeaway that you, that you take from my research. But I model that formally. Um, I put together a uh, um, formal statement of what I just said, and then I discuss the multiple equilibria that come if you buy those assumptions and sort of run with them. So um, in summary, I don't argue that the key mechanisms that kept peace were enforcement. It's not a top-down story of do-gooders. It's a bottom-up story of adaptation. Um, I argue that Russia couldn't really or didn't really care about the details of who was who. So you're in the lower half of my two by two, not the upper half of my two by two. Um, we could talk more about that assumption if you'd like, but I'll, I'll just leave it there for now as, a, as an assumption, as a stylized assumption. Um, and what that means in practice is that they don't keep track of side switching. So if you start as an insurgent but become an incumbent, and then become an insurgent again, and then become an incumbent again, and then become an insurgent again, you're kind of allowed to do that. And the Russians, even though they're peacekeepers, um, they're, they, they let people do that. Um, that's the process of working it out. That mechanism of side switching is central to the entire mechanism in my, in my story. Um, that's not the same as reconciliation of conflict identities. That is not the same as bearing the hatchet or socially transforming people's values to make the root cause issues of the Civil War go away. Everyone stays cynical. Everyone stays focused on getting paid. And um, as I mentioned, no, no one disarms. Um, what keeps a lot of these bargains solid, what makes the equilibrium, uh, what makes the equilibrium Nash subgame perfect, is that people keep their guns and can threaten a coup against the president if the president reneges too much. And that is what makes everything stick. So the violence uh, is part of the game, the way that I tell the story. Um, finally, and this is quite different from the liberal story, uh, I believe that there's a lot of evidence, and I could show you some in the Q&A if you, if you care, that foreign charity, foreign aid can actually have perverse effects. That um, locals can understand that the expectation of more aid means there's something now really worth fighting for. So now's the time to form a militia, like right now, um, because I want to be able to capture my share of the rents. Um, that is a plausible um, thing that comes out of the model, and I think that there's evidence of that actually happening in Georgia and Tajikistan. So with that said, I'm kind of in the lower right-hand corner. I, I stand askew from the standard debate between do we get involve ourselves or not involve ourselves in, in a humanitarian intervention. I think that um, that is a useful debate, and I teach it, but uh, I am in the lower right-hand corner with, with my theory. Um, you might want to think about it as a limited liability approach. Um, to, po to post decolonization politics. The idea that um, if you can somehow credibly commit to not paying attention to local nuance, things might work themselves out better. Very, very different than saying we should be paying a lot of attention to local nuance. Very, very different assumptions than the liberal assumptions. Um, and it works best in a place uh, where the United States is not a third party to the conflict because we're bad at making that credible commitment. We're really good at measuring things. We like to do it. I have no idea how we would actually credibly commit to not measuring things. But Russia could. They just didn't care. These are some pictures. This is why you, um, this is, well, I, I won't say that. <laughs> um, 
it is useful for me to filter data through a mathematical prism. I spent a lot of time out in the field talking to a lot of different people, doing a lot of work that I think a lot of people recognize as more anthropology than political science, to be honest with you. It's part of why I, I'm surprised to be in this room. Um, but at the end of all, collecting all of that data, it did matter that I filtered all of my data through a story that's essentially a tricked out stag hunt and not a story that is essentially a tricked out hawk dove game. Those, there, there are real differences there and it differences in terms of how I wrote it up and what I did with it. And I could unpack that more if you want, but you probably don't care, so I don't want to bog down in it. We can come back to this slide and spend a lot of time on it. Um, one of the nice things about the assumption of interchangeability is that it allows you to start seeing uh, a lot of the noise fall out of the big picture. And what ends up mattering at the end are three big parameters, what I call S, which is how many hunters have to coordinate to catch the stag, the analogy of catching the stag in this setting is um, allowing yourself to become part of the state security service and capturing the capital city. But are you going to get a lot of help with that from foreign assistance, which means that S is lower? Or are you basically going to have to do it yourself, which means S is higher? If all the warlords have to work together, that's one parameter. If not that many of them have to work together because they're going to get a lot of foreign help, that's a lower parameter. And that's, that's one parameter in the model, one thing that changes. Another big parameter that matters is how much meat is on the stag which in my story is how much foreign aid is saturating the capital city. And that isn't necessarily foreign governments um, doing uh, bilateral, bilateral aid. Uh, a lot of the key foreign aid that matters are salaries of NGO workers doing the liberal stuff, raising the rental property value of downtown real estate in the capital city. Um, because once you can charge four or $500 for an apartment in the downtown capital city, um, you can then give the apartment building to the warlord and the warlord can give one of the rooms to his mother and um, also draw an income from that. And that is more income than most warlords can get by not being, by being up in the mountains selling drugs or something. That is a real tangible uh, wealth transfer that can happen um, in the background of foreign charity. So that's one example of what I mean when I say V star. R is the reservation value. That's what you get by going for the rabbit. You know, what do you get by staying out of this consolidation game? Um, the consolidation game is a probabilistic game. You're not guaranteed to win. This isn't an environment where the government can just write you a contract and say, we'll pay you in a couple of years. You know, the <laughs> president might not be there in a couple of years, right? And so, you know, you, you can guarantee yourself some kind of payment by staying out of this game and staying in the mountains and not disarming. And that's, in the stag hunt analogy, that's what you get by playing rabbit. So that's R. Um, Put these three parameters together, mash them up and shake, and you can get three different equilibria, um, one of which is state failure, one of which is partial incorporation, which is just jargon for some warlords and some and don't, some, some join and some don't, or full incorporation, which is that everybody joins. Moving the parameters can get you from partial incorporation to full incorporation. No change of parameters can get you from state failure to partial incorporation. If you're in a state failure, it's like um, if you're in the bad equilibrium in a, in a stag hunt, you know? If everyone's playing rabbit, doesn't matter how fat the stag is. You know, it, it's, so that's the, um, that's the engine. That's what's going on under the hood of my book. So through this framework, to wrap up, uh, what worked before? Uh, we basically let Russian security preferences dictate the outer bounds of what got written down in the UN Security Council, and then um, we, the West, sent a bunch of liberal charity money over decades to try to help. And then locals stole a lot of that and made peace um, in my story. That is, that is what happened. Um, this begs a few important questions with respect to Ukraine. First, um, who is, who's this we that we're talking about? Um, who's actually going to send the money? Um, and uh, 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 what kind of money are we talking about? Are we talking about reconstruction and development aid? Are we talking about tough love IMF packages? Are we talking about um, large scale military transfers? Like, can you build it in my district? Those are really, really different kinds of V-star that we could potentially use to uh, buy out the East if we wanted to think about that kind of carrot and stick game playing out in Ukraine. In that framework, I wanted to say something positive and optimistic and maybe even utopian, as I sort of hinted that I would. We tend to think about this as a two-player game between the West and Russia, but it's totally not. Um, it is actually a game between this incohate group of countries that share a lot of values and a lot of institutional linkages called the West and Russia. And if we disaggregate the West, you find that there's another member of the P5 of the Security Council that actually has a, a veto and a vote and much more interest in Ukraine than we remember, which is France. Um, I think Macron uh, could basically settle this in the next two years if he wanted to. 
Um, it would require real political leadership and some difficult trade-offs. Um, but the truth is that if the worst of all possible things happened in Ukraine, if the frozen conflict thawed and it got very, very violent um, and there was a real refugee crisis, serious style refugee crisis coming out of Ukraine, um, a lot of the Ukrainian refugees would run east um, like they did before, but a lot of them would also run west. And that's something that French voters could use in the back of their minds um, to, to talk themselves into maybe doing more. Um, or just generically, France could talk itself into doing more because it would provide a real public good for Europe and allow French to have a leadership position in providing public goods for Europe. This is a focal point for coordination on the Security, uh, Security Council that France could behind the scenes work things out and then drag the European Union along with it and then slowly get the United States and Great Britain to play as well. That is my hope. Um, that is my genuine emphatic hope for how we could make this end. Um, can we think a way out of this? Yes, actually. I, it's actually not that hard when you sit down and think about the bargaining position that would be required to get something Pareto improving that would be good from the perspective of all of the P5 of the United Nations and most Ukrainians. Tim Colton and Sam Sharap do it in the back of their book. I could do it here for you if you'd like. Um, but before we get there, um, we need to somehow solve this bargaining problem. And the, I think the best way for the bargaining problem to get solved is for France to step up and, um, and, declare, and declare its ideal point more clearly. Um, the last thing I want to mention, though, is the bad news, which is that there is a real spoiler problem here. Um, and that's the other thing that comes out of Civil War studies that is an important thing to keep in mind. Giving Ukrainians agency, as I, I went to great length in this talk to do, means that it is not sufficient for us to just say, well, the great powers could work this out and then you know, impose it on Ukraine. And then Ukraine will just deal, and, and that, that will be how this will work out. There has to be buy-in from within Ukrainian society. And I think that that buy-in is its easy to imagine that happening with enough Western aid liquid floating around their society. Um, yeah, I can imagine quite a lot, as Han Solo says in Star Wars. Um, you know, you start imagining uh, lots and lots and lots of money in Ukraine, and you can imagine people talking themselves into a lot of different kinds of settlements. But Ukraine has leverage in this, uh, and Ukrainians, particularly fringe Ukrainians on the far right, might have leverage over settlement here um, that would allow them to essentially veto bargains that might be good from the perspective of outsiders. And I'm going to give one scenario that strikes me as, as, as pretty plausible and very scary, which is, was, was, this is a map from my book, and I describe the circumstances in my book of where this map came from, and I encourage you to buy it. It's in, it's in paperback, and it's a, it's, a, it's a scintillating read. But, um, you know, one of the things that was pointed out to me is that at some point in the future, if things aren't going well enough for people in um, the far west part of Ukraine, they could just secede, you know? They could just like do what the, um, what the Slovenes did um, and, uh, or, or what the Slovaks did. <coughs> Happened both times. You know, you just, you just democratically leave the Ukrainian polity and we're gonna call it Polia or Habsburgia or you know, whatever. It'll be a new country. Um, the, 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 the squishy, you know, hard line, he's just making up where it is, you know, at the time. But the point is that if they democratically secede, that leaves behind a different polity with different demographics. And um, no one ever blames the Slovenes for Yugoslavia, right? Like no one ever winds the clock in Yugoslavia all the way back to the Slovenian secession because only 20 people died, right? But if you remove demographically the part of Ukraine that feels like it is being sold out you know, by the West or whatever, that could potentially really uh, uh, cause real problems, cause, cause Yugoslavia-style problems. The other source of leverage that Ukraine has that, frankly, Georgia doesn't is um, uh, this nuclear thing, that uh, Georgia does not have the option tomorrow of pulling out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty just to see what happens. Um, but Ukraine actually does have the option to do that, just to see what happens. And, um, you know, one scenario involves uh, large-scale social mobilization that we would see coming. It would be coming down the pipeline for months and months and months, and graduate students would write papers about it. The other could essentially be a decision made by a small handful of people at the top of the Ukrainian state. And both of those are sources of leverage, unusual sources of leverage, that um, are reasons to not let this crisis just simmer for 20 or 30 years the way that Abhazia has simmered for 20 or 30 years. So, um, uh, 
I, I, I've, I've gone on for too long, and I don't think I've left as much time as I hope to for questions, but thank you for your patience, and I look forward to saying more. Very well asked question. My hunch is uh, that if the Russian little green men backbone were to disengage from the Donbass region, there's still a lot of people in the Donbass capable of potentially putting up resistance. However, um, uh, how much influence they have while it's disputed seems pretty, uh, pretty strong to me from the documentary evidence that we've gotten out from various ethnographic observations that I kind of trust. It seems like the Russians really are um, the, from a distance, you know, we see the skin of the, of the military machine in the Donbass. I think that they are the, the blood vessels of, of what's going on in the Donbass. But I don't really know. If, if there were going to be a, kind of a French-led solution on this, I imagine that it would begin with a tacit understanding along the lines that you mentioned about Crimea that would then have to be formalized later with the UN Security Council resolution because we all want to have the same map. And then it would be something like a soft promise by Russia to pull all of the little green men out, like 150 kilometers back, um, flood the area with OSCE observers. I, I, would, I would, from, from the perspective of, my, of the model in my book, what would make the most sense would be the least well-armed but most well-funded OSCE mission in human history. Um, and you could call it like a, uh, um, an election observation uh, mission. Um, so a lot of people with smartphones and handguns, like no heavy weapons, that are there to make sure that there's no, uh, um, uh, not only no little green men in the area, but no heavy weapons in the area. And then they monitor the election that Ukraine has agreed to have under Minsk II, which will create, it won't be a competitive election, because it, it's the East, you know, so that will create a giant pro-Russia party that Russia could then use to have influence in the country, which is something else Russia wants other than, other than Crimea. You get an organized base there. And um, you will have, of course, a lot of people in, for generations probably, you'll have people living in the East who will tell themselves war stories of how they heroically fought off the Nazis. And there'll be elementary school textbooks that will, you know, memorialize their grandfathers as heroes. I mean, we can't stop that, right? And so the story of what they tell themselves about whether they were the heroic resistors or whether they were led around by the nose, there I think we could just let good old-fashioned nationalism do the work for us. And so it might not matter whether the Russians are really helping them as if they tell the story of them resisting themselves. And so, but, I, but your question is really a, an empirical, the sharp edge of your question is an empirical one that, that I don't know, right? I don't, I don't really understand command and control on the Russian side because that's really murky stuff. I'd also like, as a point on that, I did not place phone calls to the east. You know, it's one thing for me to get on Skype and call up people on the Ukrainian side about how, how how many guys do you claim to have working for you? If I made those same phone calls across the, the line of control, I would think I would be putting people in trouble and also not getting good data. So it's just, so I, so I, I with a bullet, I don't know. Absolutely not. And it is resisted. No, no, it, sense of that, they, no sense of that. So therefore they do want some sort of settlement, potentially want some sort of settlement. Or they want it to be a permanently unsettled conflict because that is the best way to checkmate NATO expansion. Yeah, except that it's very costly. Modest costs. He asked a question first in the back and then there. Oh, yeah, I don't have a good theory for that. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah. The squares are cities, right? That's where you have more than one district per area. Um, yeah. And the, the star is obviously Kia. But, yeah, no, I, okay. turnout was more in those areas. Okay. What's the big question? Other one is um, when the militias were sort of institutionalized into the Ukrainian state, were they professionalized as well? Like, was the pact that when they, like, sort of endorsed the militias entirely? Or, like, do units now have? Some regiments had the names they had when they were 
I don't know enough about the details to answer that question with certainty. My sense is that there are a lot more, uh, there's, it's a lot more the former than the latter um, in stage one. Um, but it is also the case, uh, this is easily verifiable by anyone who spent time in Kiev, that there are a lot of people who were integrated into the state um, and then thanked for their service and are now begging for money in like the, the subways, right? So in addition, even if we're in a world which is uh, more pessimistic, it's clear that not all these guys are being kept around. So if you're an alcoholic or a sociopath or you're just not fitting in that well, the, the Ukrainian state has um, shown you the door at this point. And um, these people are now trying to organize and they're mad because they're not getting the pensions that they feel they're owed. And, and you kind of get the sense that maybe some of these guys were just joining up in the first place to smooth their, you know, smooth a career into the security services, which I can see how they would do. I can see why that would be a good thing to do. That's a lot of what the people I talked to in Georgia and Ukraine did. A lot of the militias are actually in the east. I mean, so there's an interesting, I didn't say that, but it's. Are they on that list? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. the, no, so the, these guys that we're talking about um, are from all over the country on this list. And the list goes on. This is just the first page of the, the, first page of the list. But to make it readable, I, I cut it off. Yeah, no. Um, it is an important social fact that uh, a lot of the militias, especially in 2014 and, uh, and 2015, the, the, the lingua franca within the militia was Russian. You know, it is, it, it's not these, these far right groups from the far west who speak Ukrainian proudly and have um, uh, problematic symbolism who are doing all of the fighting. Um, <laughs> anyway, they're, they're not the backbone of the pro-Ukraine fighting. It's, it, it is people uh, recruited in and around Kharkiv and in and around uh, the, 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 the conflict zone itself, the people who feel their families would be most threatened if this country tipped into, um, uh, tipped into their families. My question is partially answered by what you just said, because I was wondering to what extent, uh, and this kind of looks at things from the other, other side of what John was concerned about, is, is the far right driving this conflict? And by far right, I mean the guys in Maidan who were actually shooting Mm -hmm. killing demonstrators uh, during that awful event yep. uh, who want to keep things riled up in a certain sense they, they share the Russian goal of keeping this into a, you know, a frozen conflict uh, have you found out much about them I mean these are pretty, pretty awful people it seems like <laughs> So at this stage in the conflict, I think it is accurate to say they're not all that important. And, and again, that's something that is much easier to say ex post than it was ex ante. Um, uh, I think a lot of their uh, importance was exaggerated by Russians at the time for strategic, strategic reasons. Um, I also uh, think that we should be careful about claims involving who killed who on Maidan. I mean, I, the, 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 there is a, uh, um, there's a prominent, uh, conspiracy theory that the Maidan massacre was actually a false flag operation and that those 40 people were not killed by police snipers but they were actually killed by the far right, you know, firing under a false flag and pretending to be police snipers. That strikes me as completely Kennedy theory insane, to be honest with you. But that, but <laughs> there is a paper with a lot of footnotes that is um, floating around out there which is trying to press this point of view, which I just see as evidence that these historical narratives are never really um, going to converge. Yeah, there was a German TV crew that got in there uh, soon after my job, but over and they did all kinds of sophisticated uh, know, studies on which bullets came from where and yeah. the vicious angle. So on and on and on. It got just was widely reported. There's um, and and this paper which I read. There's this there's this paper. There's also, you know, the there's an, kind of an ongoing court case, but all of this is super politicized because what we're essentially doing is using the courts to relitigate the legitimacy of Maidan. And of course, there, this is obviously a political question, not a, um, a social science empirical question. And so we, I think we just have to be careful here with these kinds of, these kinds of claims. Um, what is their role? 
um, it kind of depends on um, how seriously you take the scenarios that I that I articulated in the last slide because I think they're what they're, th there's a really really nice piece in the national interest a couple of weeks ago talking about the um, just how ubiquitous these militias are in Ukraine and I think that the the next question in terms of political realignment in Ukraine about like what is the new center right coalition going to look like um, that keeps these fringers out is 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 a is a big question but. We're, we're a couple of years away from the election that will actually answer that question. So it will be answered at the ballot box probably. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, um, I anticipated that question with my final provocative slide. I think that um, the, your, your question has the seeds of, a, of, of stalemate in it. And if you want to talk yourself out of this being a sustainable thing, then you have to imagine a counterfactual world that we're not actually living in right now in which things were really, really bad. And that's how we would talk ourselves into action. And it would have to be bad not just for uh, U.S.-Russia relations, um, or it, would, it would have to be bad for, for Europe. And that's, it's, it's, it's easy to imagine that, but until that actually materializes, um, maybe a stalemate is, is the future. I, I will say that um, long-term big picture, it might be that Russia has a comparative advantage in resolve over the issue-specific Ukraine uh, bargaining stuff, even if we have a comparative advantage in military power. So if you think about this as a sort of a long-term bargaining game, you know, where Russia is trying to signal in every way it can what it will really fight over as its relative power shrinks over time, as its global relative power shrink shrinks, and you see this through that kind of a framework, I think Russia really cares about Ukraine. And for the United States to say, well, we don't care that you care, we're going to just uh, let Ukrainians choose what organizations they want to be in and maybe we'll expand NATO, maybe we won't, and, and just kind of continue postponing the conversation is going to eventually uh, cause problems with global governance if we want to have Russia be part of the conversation. And so that could have implications for relations with issues that we're not even thinking about right now. But if you want Russian help with the nuclear nonproliferation regime, if you want Russian help with China, if you want Russian help with anything, um, you know, at some point we have to ask ourselves, um, some kind of question about whether we care more about relations with Moscow or more about uh, relations with Europe that may or may not include Kiev. And, but that's a very, very delicate set of questions for professional diplomats, to be honest with you. I, and I, I can in my heart see this being stalemated for a long time. I could see this turning into Abkhazia, or, but with less secure borders and really big. Um, I could also see even darker worlds where it, it militarizes and we have a frozen conflict that is much more like the DMZ in Korea. Um, you know, with, with thousands of soccer ball sized drones, you know, shooting at each, like, like the kind of the escalation in weapon systems that we're talking about here is really quite sophisticated as, as arms race space, so. Yes. Yes. I understand exactly what you're asking, and yeah, there, there is a movement within Ukraine um, uh, articulating exactly that position. Um, the the question of whether they would be immediately admitted into NATO, subsequent to redrawing their own map unilaterally, I, I think is an open one. But the wishful thinking that informs your question is very real in the Ukrainian polity, and there's a lot of people who will go further. And they'll call it wishful? Wishful because I'm not positive that post-map redrawing they get into NATO just like that. Oh, I see. That's why. Um, I, I think the, well, there's, that's why, on, on, on that question. Um, also, it's not entirely clear that, that, that they could, uh, that, that, that that faction within the Ukrainian center has the votes to actually get that through the Rada and, and through, through Ukrainian society. That, that's another wishful. It may not be any m more or less fanciful than my, f than my French, uh, you know, my, my French scenario. But I don't know. I, I, uh, 
I, I, was, I was going to go further. There, the, the argument that is often articulated in Ukraine is if we cut it off, we don't have to rebuild it. You know, that all of these people who we've now bombed um, into oblivion, you know, great, let's just make that Russia's problem. And plus, we don't like those people anyway. I mean, like, the, the, like you, you quickly see how this cascades to be not the moderate position, but something that sounds much more, uh, anti much, much more Ukrainian nationalist, much more anti-Russian, say. And um, part of the political problem is figuring out how to articulate it in a way that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't sound like that. But uh, I think that there would also be political problems if that happened. So. You, I, I could easy, easily imagine a civil war breaking out in the rump state with a lot of those people wanting to be part of the um, <laughs> don't don't leave us. You know, like I, I could imagine that emerging from within what we now think of as secessionist Donbass. I doubt that it would emerge from within Crimea. I, I must say, I, I don't think there's much social evidence of that. Well, a lot of the guys that I talked to were pretty low level. So to be clear about that, it, it's not, it's, it wasn't a research design where I went in uh, from the top of the hierarchy and tried to work my way down. This was definitely friends in low places. And so a lot of the people I was talking to in terms of interview data were telling me war stories about their commanders or their commander's commanders. And so I was getting the hierarchy view in that direction. Um, I also would push back a little against the word um, demobilization. Um, and the lines of control are also oftentimes family friend stuff. Like the warlords, these guys that I describe as warlords, are asking people to make long-term uh, costly sacrifices based on some probabilistic promise of future gains. It's like someday when I'm a boss, I'll be able to give you rents. And there's no institutions. It's not like an army. You know, these, that, that's why the um, it's why charisma and this other ephemeral stuff ends up really, really mattering in terms of determining who can actually play the warlord game and who can't. So the, in, that, in, in that setting, uh, a lot of the demobilization, you know, demobilization the way I describe it, is actually people just switching one warlord to another when they realize that this warlord can't actually pay them. You know, that he's been, he's been talking, talking really, really charismatically for six or seven months and like that black leather jacket doesn't look as awesome as it did six or seven months ago. And that is, that's quite different than what we oftentimes mean in, in the um, police reform literature or this kind of like emergent literature on, you know, how can we do this better? We as USAID do this better. Like th that's, it's, it's different. So um, was that responsive to both parts of your question? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, this is um, we speculating about w Russia's response to speculative moves is obviously this. Is, we're starting to play chess with ourselves, but yeah, yeah, um, hit me. I, I guess what I'm really driving at, I apologize if I made you late. Um, oh, don't worry about it. Is, is, do you think the Russian um, drive in Eastern Ukraine is actually to further conflict and prevent the Is that the objective? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well asked question. I think that. Uh, um, if it is true that what they really want is an unsettled conflict that stops NATO expansion, they have that with Crimea for free. Um, because I think that it's become pretty clear with Merkel that the, the psychological barrier to um, seeing this as anything other than the Anschluss is very real for, for, for her anyway. And as long as she's in Germany, like that, I don't see that map changing without a massive expansion of political capital, which is why I, you know, I'm not talking in vague terms about you, like Europeans need to do something. It would have to be France, like really, really, doing something and it would be it would be costly to make that happen absent that i think the frozen conflict the disputed map um 
I, I've written about this in security studies a little bit, but just to bring everyone everyone up to date, the, the argument that's being made here is that a frozen conflict is optimal from Russia's point of view because it forces NATO when it thinks about expansion to realize that the minute this country joins NATO, we have an Article Five obligation to roll back Russia's presence there. You know, that, that, that <laughs> and so, one node back down the game tree, we just don't expand NATO to these countries and that that's what Russia wants to begin with. That's the spirit of, of what, what's being asked. Yeah, so he gets that for free with Crimea. Doesn't need the Donbass for that. The other thing I would say with this NATO conversation is that I think I have no authority over anything. So, you know, this is just me making stuff up here. I think it would be really good uh, for, for signaling and for policy and for a lot of reasons if we could somehow within NATO um, disaggregate what we want to do with NATO expansion in terms of um, force projection and military professionalization from the parts of NATO that are about nuclear deterrence and missile defense systems that are going to be deployed in the future. Like if we could somehow explain, you know, I don't know how we, we roll back the Bucharest Declaration. Like the Bucharest Declaration of 2008 says that Ukraine and Georgia will be part of NATO. It, full stop. That is exactly how it says it and exactly what it says. And uh, because NATO is a consensus organization, how to unsay that is not entirely clear. So that's been said. Um, I think what we what NATO could say is something like, and <laughs> uh, we will never deploy national missile defense or theater defense systems in, in, the, in the outer space over Ukraine, which would send a, like, a system, like, we're not trying to go after your nuclear second strike. You know, we're not trying to move the border of space warfare right over <laughs> right over uh, Moscow. We're trying to, we're really interested in keeping this big happy security community big and happy and secure. But this is not the NATO of uh, 1946. We've accomplished what we wanted to accomplish with that version of NATO. Um, and even though the organization has the same name, you know, some, so uh, the, 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 I mentioned theater missile defense and, and the, the, the kind of nuclear issue because I think this is a good room to do it in. But Figuring out how to exactly say that might change the conversation with, um, with Russia in a real way. And I'm optimistic that there's actually room in Russia to hear that. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of people who want NATO to be, um, I, I don't think it's cheap talk, um, like Thomas Reese's stuff. I, don't, I, I think there are a lot of people who really want NATO to be more of a postmodern democracy club. Um, and less of a hair trigger for nuclear war. <laughs> and, you know, the problem is that it is both right now. And that um, could perhaps be changed. It's frust it frustrates Russia that Americans pretend to not understand that and pretend that it is only the first obviously already. And, and not just Americans, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of people do this. So, yeah, certainly. I, th I think I've heard you say Donbass and Crimea are divisible and are not the same in this whole conflict. And in fact, it's over in Crimea, but it's in a continuing unsettled situation in the Donbass. Am I correct? Um, yes, I think that, that is a um, absolutely fair interpretation of what I've said. I think that one of the frustrating, one of the things I don't like, to be honest with you, about using the word civil war is that it conflates the Crimea and Donbass episodes. Um, I think that what's going on in the Donbass is unambiguously a civil war, but is ambiguous in terms of international law. I think what's going on with Crimea was an unambiguous flagrant violation of international law, but is not a civil war. And throwing those two things together is, um, is a problem. And I worry that the use of the word civil war contributes to it. So I think, I, I think you understand me fine.